This week on the Power Play Show, newly appointed executive director of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Michael J. Bobbitt. Our conversation about arts and so much more next on the Power Play. From the studios at Hull Bay Productions, this is the Power Play. Welcome to the Power Play. I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. Michael J. Bobbitt can talk the talk because, well, he's walked the walk. He's a director, choreographer, and playwright. Now Michael has cemented his dedication and contribution to the arts by being named the highest ranking cultural official in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Michael is the new executive director of the Mass Cultural Council. What does the council do and how will his new role continue the development of arts and cultural projects in the state? We have a lot to cover with my guest this week, Michael Bobbitt. Welcome to the Power Play. Thanks so much, Tonya. Every time I hear highest ranking cultural official, it kind of gives me butterflies in my stomach. What a cool title and what a lot of responsibility to have. Do you like kind of look over your shoulder like, are they talking about me? (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes I have to remind myself, but I'm excited about it. Well, we're excited that you are in this position and I can't wait to talk to you about a lot of the things that are going to be coming up for you. But first, you know, you spent your life in the arts, we can say, Um, but give us audience a little bit more about who you are, where you're from and how you kind of landed in this role. Sure. Uh, Born and raised in lower Northwest DC near Howard University, went to DC public schools. Uh, I have been on the planet for 48 years. I sort of got my connection to the arts when I was in the third act of Hansel and Gretel in the school play. There were three Hansels. My mom said that I was the best Hansel, but she, and she has no biases, so I trust her opinion. Not at all. (laughs) Not at all, not at all. Um, But in that play, I sort of got exposed to the world of dance, the world of music, and the, the, the viscera of live performance, and I, I just got hooked right away, and so, It prompted me to join the school choir, and then I picked up trumpet in the third grade and kept doing that through um, elementary school and junior high school. And when I went to high school, uh, I actually transferred out of DC public schools and went to an all boy private Jesuit high school. They were recruiting from DC public school kids. But that's when my love of trumpet kind of took over my life. And so I actually went to college um, to major in trumpet, classical trumpet, European classical trumpet, I should call it. Um, And after a couple of years of that, I just missed dance and I missed theater. And so I left college and went back to the dance world and trained at the Washington Ballet and the Dance Theater of Harlem. I don't know why a 6'2", 220 pound man thought he could be a ballet dancer, but I did it. I tried. Uh, And then I eventually moved over into musical theater and I spent a good 10 years touring the country in regional theater in Summerstock, um, performing as a musical theater performer. And then to make ends meet, I, uh, I taught theater and dance on the side and did some choreography, which led to directing. And then eventually, um, when I was 29, I adopted a baby from Vietnam. Okay. And when, yeah. And so what I realized was when I was going to the theater to perform every night, I was missing all the cool bedtime rituals, the stories in the bath. So I realized that was not making me happy. So I transitioned from performing to teaching, choreographing and directing, and then used the time I could on the side to learn about theater management and you know how do you fundraise, how do you manage a staff, how do you build, build capacity. And that led to a couple of jobs um, running organizations. I was the director of touring productions for the Smithsonian's Theater. And then I ran a small theater company in DC and grew that to be a large theater company. And then I moved up here two summers ago to run um, Watertown's new repertory theater. And after 17 months of doing that, uh, Mass Cultural Council came a call in and I uh, went through the interview process and, and got the job and sort of here I am. It's fascinating to me that you just seem so well-rounded in your your career with the arts. And so you kind of really come into this position having a really good sense of everything from the creative to the business to the practical um, experience of being. Is that something that really kind of made you the perfect fit for this position? Um, 
I think so. And in, in, in addition to the vast work I've been doing in the race equity world, I've been sort of studying that that sort of sector for about eight years now. But I definitely have a lot of empathy for artists because I've been in the classrooms, I've been in the rehearsals, I've been in the performances. You can see from my background, I love collecting art. I remember in high school, I was in the art club for four years. So I have a tactical um, uh, idea of what it takes to be an artist. And also, and also I run arts organizations. Uh, I've been on the board for arts organizations. I've been on the board for sort of community-wide organization. So I I didn't know all of that was setting me up for a job like this, but I'm glad it has. And I think I bring a lot of empathy for, um, for large and small organizations alike, and also our, our individual artists who I'm obsessed with, obsessed with individual artists. And we have to figure out how to, how to help them through this time period. Yeah, the pandemic has certainly had its uh, impact on the arts in, in theater, in movies, um, pretty much across the board. What kind of things are in place now that we are seeing the vaccine coming to um, everywhere, you know, as it is? And so things are going to start to slowly get back to normal, whatever that normal is. What does that look like in terms of the arts in Boston, say maybe this summer? Yeah, I don't know because I, I don't know, even with the vaccine, until we get herd immunity, until people feel really comfortable being in a crowded space with more than 100 people, I don't know if the reopening is going to be more delayed for arts organizations. Most of the arts and cultural institutions, they make their revenue or keep their doors open by having large groups of people. In fact, the more people, the better gather in one space to consume it. Um, so there's lots. Of, so we have a couple of grants that we are promoting, and there's also some legislation to get more money for organizations to upgrade their systems, like their HVAC systems, and put in um, protective plexiglass and st stuff like that. So that's part of the process. Um, hopefully, once we know more about um, what the reopening can look like, we can actually gather information from the field and share best practices so people can start thinking about that. I'm also trying to get our arts organizations to really think about the benefits of digital um, um, consumption of art. Uh, my sort of metaphor is like the sporting industry. When sports started streaming into people's homes, more people got the chance to consume sports. And the difference in, the, in what you get when you go to the stadiums and the venues and see it live is vastly different than the experience you have when you're watching it at home on TV. And they figured out some new creative things to do on TV that you can't do at the live venues. So you can have colorful commentary, you can have people drawing on screen, you can replay, you can do slow-mo. So what are, the, what are the things we can do as arts organizations to add that to the experience so that if we are not able to reopen, we can still still bring services to people in their homes. Um, working really hard right now to to get federal money, to get um, state money. We want all of our arts lovers out there to write their legislators and let them know they support arts and culture. And please give us what we're asking for. Um, and then and then I need to start thinking about um, how we can sort of change law to support our individual gig artists. I think most people don't really re really realize that the arts gig artists who work so hard to pull together enough revenue just to survive in a right. year, right. all of it's gone. Like it's all gone. They're all having to do side gigs to make a living. And so, and then in the second part is that because they were gig artists, they weren't eligible for unemployment. And so, wow. they're, yeah, we just learned that, that I think it was more than 20% of um, unemployment. The arts industry was hit higher than any other industry by like 20 more than 20 percent so a lot of brainstorming is going to have to happen a lot of collective thinking so we can really bring back this whole industry have you talked to any of the artists themselves because i i've had a couple of interviews with artists who are just not working right now and you know beyond the financial impact it's just the just being fed you know, with the, with having to be able to perform your craft, that there's just nothing there. Just the idea of, you know, getting up and, and either, whether it's practicing or rehearsing and none of that's there. Have you talked to any of the other artists and kind of get, you know, a gauge of what they're feeling and what they're going through? 
Yeah, all the time. I mean, I, I believe that the arts is as much as it, as it is a is a career. It's also a vo vocation. So it called you. It's not something that you are called to. It called you to, to, to be a part of it. And it's the thing that feeds you. And that's why so many artists love it, even though they're getting underpaid and they scramble to keep jobs. When they get that opportunity, they are just so fulfilled with the work. And so to not have any of that, it uh, some of the artists I talk to, it sort of goes to your the center and the core of who you are as a person, because if you can't do this thing that I am known for, that I've trained for all my life, then who am I? Right. So there's a lot, it, 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 it breaks my heart, but I, I, we, we will survive. I mean, we we are resilient people and I think we'll survive. And the other thing, the, the reason why I know we'll survive is because there's no one out there that is equipped to see the world differently and see the world the way it should be than artists. So they'll come up with new ideas. Let's talk about the Mass Cultural Council and give our audience, because we are seen in different states, give our audience um, an idea of what the Mass Cultural Council is and what its mission is. In, in its core, the Mass Cultural Council works to elevate the sort of rich cultural life of Massachusetts. And we partner with a lot of communities across the whole Commonwealth to expand access, uh, improve education, promote diversity, and encourage excellence in the arts also the humanities and the sciences. And we do that uh, a couple of ways. One, we offer a lot of services to our organizations and our artists. These are professional development services or, or ways to improve your business services. But the biggest thing that we do is we give a lot of grants money to our, um, arts organizations, cultural institutions, humanities and science organizations, plus um, individual artists and scientists as well. So there's 23 different grant programs and seven different wraparound services that we offer throughout the year. Most of our funding comes from um, appropriations from the state. So everyone pays their taxes because people want schools and roads and hospitals and they want arts in their world. So we get a little bit of money from the state to um, give back out to the industry. Last year, we got 18.2. We're starting the advocacy campaign to get it to be 20, I should say 18.2 million. We're starting the advocacy campaign to get it to 20 million. Um, the governor has suggested 16.4, which is a 10.4% cut. And we don't want that. We want to get, we want to get it higher because I don't think our, our industry can suffer any more losses. Um, but yeah, so grants and services, and then just generally supporting and advocating for the whole field. Has the Cultural Council taken a hit um, as a result of COVID like most institutions have over the past year? No, because all of our, all of our we don't have earned revenue streams. Okay. Um, so we're not charging for our services. All of our money comes from, most of it comes from the state allocation, but some of it comes from federal allocation and a few private donors. Um, the hit that we've taken is having to pivot on programs that didn't happen. Um, we were, um, the state gave us some money to re-give out in, in the CARES Act. Um, we also had, um, since there were some money that wasn't claimed because field trips started, stopped happening, we were able to move some of that money to give more money to, to artists and organizations. So that was the hit. We, like, I would say we doubled our workload. And what challenges can you foresee just in as we start again getting back to a normal um, life do you what kind of challenges do you foresee in terms of you know getting these institutions these these theaters these these production companies back open back open to the public um, you know we know that the MFA was closed down for months um, during the during the pandemic, what kind of what kind of challenges and what kind of um, efforts do you foresee in terms of getting some of these organizations back up and running? Yeah, well, there are a number of things. We just finished a survey. 981 institutions reported um, 588 million plus dollars in loss. And that's only the organizations that reported. So one can assume there's many, many more. So that's the least impact. So that kind of bleeding that has happened, we have to kind of refill from the bleeding because I don't, I, you know, I don't know how these organizations have gotten through with that kind of loss. 
Also, we had almost 3,000 individual artists report um, more than $30 million lost, an average of 10 million each. So the first thing we have to do is kind of replenish that loss. So put some get get some money back into these organizations and into the pockets of the artists so they can just get back to square one. The second part is making sure that the institutions are safe enough for people to go back and inhabit. So a lot of people have to reopen their, um, so sort of relook at their HVAC system, put in plexiglass, figure out new ways to keep their buildings clean. Some of the organizations, we also saw $30,000, I mean, 30,000 people, um, jobs were affected, either either eliminated or furloughed or um, reduced hours or reduced salaries. So many of the organizations looking at reopening don't have enough staff to actually reopen. So how do you how do you fix that? Um, and then the last big big thing is is when are people going to feel comfortable leaving their homes and going back into spaces where lots of people are gathering? So there's a number of things, and I think it's going to take a lot of creativity and a lot of work, not only from the arts and culture sector, but from anyone else that benefits from the visitorship that happens with arts and cultures. You can imagine when you go see a concert, you may go get your nails done, your hair done, you buy a new outfit, you ride public transportation, you put gas in your car, you park, you get um, ride share, you have dinner before, you have drinks after. So all of those people that benefit from people that experience the art are also being hit if the industry can't come back. Uh, so it's this strange, weird trickle down effect um, that we, we have to worry about as well. Absolutely. And, and that's just such a great point because, you know, we talked about, um, you know, just some of these these theater companies or production companies learning how to live in this digital space, if you will, which also includes having to find, you know, videographers and audio and stage technicians and all those people who are also hurting as well. So even not having um, some plan to have some of these uh, production houses or organizations move into a digital space. Um, the other part to that is just finding the people who are either still available, who, um, I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that work in the production um, world who have had to sell equipment just mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, survive, if you will. And so there's that part of the business that is also being, you know, terribly affected. And so I wonder, you know, whether or not there is an idea or two out there that can start maybe partnering with, you know, some of these production houses and these theater companies to make, you know, make some kind of deals, make some kind of art come back to life, because I think we all need that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I was just running a theater company seven weeks ago. So I was in the thick of this all trying to figure out like, you know, my business and most performing arts is live performances. We did not do digital. Only time we recorded stuff was for archival purposes or marketing purposes. We did not record it for people to consume at home because we wanted people to leave their homes and come to us. So not only did I have to have my staff, I had to find the resources, but I had to have my staff when we didn't have revenue coming in, learn what this digital art form was. And then the other part of that is why you, when you can produce these great things, your audiences aren't trained to consume theater in a digital setting. They are used to coming to a venue to see plays. So we spent all this money on producing these great digital pieces and then no one came to see it or very little people came to see it. So it's a it's a strange effect. And I think the performing arts industry is scrambling to catch up to um, to that market. And hopefully all of that work won't go away when, when our venues are safe to open. And I think to your point, it's going to take a lot of creativity. And I'm confident that that when we find the space in our day to day operations to 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 innovate and to talk to people outside of our field, we're going to come out of this well. The hardest part is that, again, I was just doing this seven weeks ago, the scramble just to bring in money 
and keep people employed didn't give you enough space in your day to day to think about what the future is. You're just, again, the whole time is thinking about stopping the bleeding. I am bleeding, yeah. I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, yeah. I need a tourniquet. And so um, I think that, that will happen. And I think, you know, the investment maybe needs to be in um, a big, massive collective marketing campaign, kind of like the I Love New York campaign that they did yep. in New York. Yep. Um, I also think an investment in um, arts education and exposure to education for the youth. It may not help things right now, but if we want to have like great arts patronage and great artists in 10, 15 years, we got to like get our kids now. I think diversity is another tactic to help us um, fill our houses when we reopen. If you think about it, the brown and black people that I know love, love arts and it's deeply a part of our culture. But most of our institutions were designed to be predominantly white. And so if those organizations as their business model can redesign to be predominantly multicultural, then you may attract a lot more people to your venue that you haven't attracted before. I also think we probably need to sort of start investing in creative placemaking, outdoor spaces uh, in a capital way. So we're building these waterfronts up or these parks so that people can, can collect around art um, in, in a safe open space. All these things are starting to rise to the surface as I start thinking about what the Mass Culture Council can do. Uh, you touched on diversity a bit and I was actually gonna start turning my discussion to that. And because one of the things that fascinates me is the number of just incredible cultural institutions that we have here in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And yet there's still a huge gap in diversity when it comes to those who visit these institutions. Um, how how can we start narrowing that that gap that idea that you know we have all this wonderful um amazing art here and yet you know in some of these institutions being right in the middle of boston roxbury area but yet there are people who aren't from these communities that are going to these institutions yeah and i and in in it's interesting because there's not a mystery behind diversifying, but it, it does feel for some reason to be this aloof thing that, that they have a hard time understanding. What has to shift is the culture, the culture that puts one race of people higher than another race of people. And that shift has to happen. And so sort of my example earlier is that most predominantly white institutions, and that's not just the arts, that's any, any sector, were designed to be predominantly white. That was their business model. They were making whatever they were making for white people and it was being made by white people um, specifically. And it's not to say those people were bad, that is just what they knew or that was a market. And maybe in some instances they were doing it to keep people of color out. What we have to do is go back and look at our whole business model and say, I want to attract a predominantly multicultural or multi multiracial client base. That means I have to go back and restructure my whole business model to be that way. And that means you have to look at who's in leadership, you have to look at who's on your board, you have to look at what your program and you have to look at what policies. And you have to change anything that holds discrimination or inequities in place. And that's a really hard thing for people to do. But I always tell people, build an action plan. If you build an action plan that has measurables, then you'll usually get to there. Most of us get stuck in the belief or the solidarity without action statements. I tell people all the time, it's like if you've ever been cheated on before, you become hyper vigilant. You're like, yeah. I want to see, let me see your email. Who are you texting? Where are you talking? What time are you coming home? Let me, who are you talking to? The person that cheated could say, trust me, I'll never cheat again. They can say it a hundred times. It means nothing until right. your actions are proving that you are trustworthy. And a lot of times we see solidarity statements or Black Lives Matter posted by organizations, but we don't see any action. That to me is actually worse because it says, I acknowledge there's a problem, but I'm not going to do anything about it. My dear friend, Rob Stull, became the first local artist whose work donned the facade of the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I spoke to him about what that meant to him uh, back in January, but I wonder, you know, what kind of impact did that have on you? He's, he's from the Boston area, African-American artist, uh, comic book artist, um, 
extraordinaire. And to just kind of drive down Huntington Avenue and see that for me was just, it was mind blowing. And I'm wondering, you know, what, did you see it and what kind of impact did that have for you? I did see it. In fact, I got to work on a song that was inspired by that artwork. I worked with Makiba McCrary. I'm oh, sure yeah. you talked to Makiba. Um, we worked on a project together. Uh, I can't wait for that song to be released to the world. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's always strange to me that we say the first black this or the first black that in 2021. I just go, it's ridiculous. And it's weird to see that and hear that. Um, but to see that was really incredible on the outside of the MFA. I thought it was a big signal to the world that we are becoming multicultural. Um, it, so it felt like a little bit of liberation, I think for all of us. I think, you know, Ms. Harris being elected as a vice president feels like liberation and it feels like joy. And I think, you know, for all of my white colleagues out there who don't understand that when those kinds of things happen, we get a, 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 a jolt of hope in our bodies and that the more we can do that it sort of bridges the gap between the privileged and the oppressed the more we can do that we're shortening this this gap that we have and the more we're, the more everyone will benefit so i was thrilled to see that and i still have the artwork actually on my laptop and i'll look at it now and again going wow that's yeah. at the mfa and also the type of art because that's not something that you would ever think that you know you're going to put hip-hop on the facade of the of the mfa and you know and when i talked to to rob about it he just felt like you know through his work he he really felt it was so important for that story to be told in that way and um and i just i hope that you know we've kind of seen it in dance you know through the dance theater of harlem alvin ailey we've seen we've seen it through dance we've seen it through some theater productions but now in terms of visual art to me it it was just really profound to kind of see that type of work um, yeah I, I have a great friend his name is archie lasalle he's doing a and maybe you can have him on the show someday but he's doing a whole project called where the black people at and it's specifically targeting museums that have not showcased um, black art. So keep a lookout for that. But um, yeah, one of the exercises I do with people, and I got this from a friend of mine, is when I start sort of race equity workshops, I have them close their eyes and think about art. Think about art, think about dance, think about music, and then tell me what you saw most of the time it's white art or white European based art. And I'll say to them, how many of you thought about hip hop? I thought about African dance, I thought about salsa. That shows, you, that shows you the kind of bias that we all have. And, that, and that's the kind of thing we wanna fight against in our institutions. We wanna make sure that our biases are not there and that we are talking about art holistically, which includes multiculturalism. You know, in terms of arts in school, we know that at least this past year that um, with, you know, COVID and the remote learning or the hybrid learning that arts really, really took a hit this year in the schools. I have a 13 year old um, at home. And so he he really has kind of missed that part of his curriculum. You know, it, it's a it's a challenging time, but how you know, what kind of things can schools do just maybe on a minimum basis to just kind of keep arts education in the curriculums, even though this is, you know, this is unprecedented, I get it. And, you know, it's probably not the priority, but some people may say it should be part of the priority. Yeah, one of the things that schools can do right now is that they can help us advocate for more funding and make their voice heard if they really feel like arts are important for schools. Um, certainly there is, if, if the school can't provide it, there's other sources of, of uh, we have plenty of nonprofits out there that can provide you with art services. There's enough on the, in the digital world to, to, to find it. Um, it's important. I mean, the, the, the main thing that's important um, about it is we need creative thinkers. We need critical and creative thinkers. The world progresses because someone has an idea and then they bring it to life. And if we don't teach our kids by exposing them to the arts to expand their mind beyond what's right there in front of them, then we'll never have hope of progressing. 
Um, I always think that imagination is seeing the world different. Creativity is bringing imagination to life. And art is the product of creativity. So art is the way to teach people how to expand their minds. We have to get it to them. We have to get it to them when they're young. And I've read so many reports because the last theater I ran was a children's theater. I've read so many reports that the more you expose to kids when they're younger, before the age of eight, the better for them. After eight, it's hard to turn them on to art into becoming lifelong patrons of the arts or even creative thinkers. It just gets harder. So get it to them when they're in elementary school. But we definitely have to support arts education in schools. We are coming to the end segment of the Power Play show where I typically ask our guests three questions. And my first question is, and you've touched upon this uh, a little bit in our interview, but what is your hope for arts and culture in Boston, in Massachusetts, I should say, when the pandemic is over? Well, I want us to become more racially diverse. That's a huge hope of mine. The reason why I'm in this is because way back in first grade, someone said, hey, little kid, little poor black kid, you've got something. And that thing that I got to experience set me off on a whole life um, life, and maybe even saved me. Um, so I want art to be diverse and to know that people's lives can be changed when we become multicultural and diverse. Two, I want us to not only recover, but to expand beyond to have an arts boom in the state. I mean, wouldn't that be exciting to see a big, massive arts boom? And that's going to require a lot of creative creativity and a plan. Um, and I'd say lastly, that we become obsessed by making sure that every little kid gets to experience the arts in this, in this whole state. Um, it can be the thing we are known for. Uh, and maybe the thing I'm going to try to push for in, in, during my tenure at, at Mass Culture Council. My second question is, who is or was your greatest artistic inspiration and why? Ooh. At various different times, at various different people. When I was studying trumpet, it was Wynton Marsalis because he could play jazz and classical. Hmm, uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer. I think there, I think I was, my high school band teacher was just a great person. Just a great person. Okay. Lastly, what is the one thing you want people to know about the cultural presence in Boston and how special it is? There is so much that you don't know about. I mean, every single day I learn about all the different new organizations that we have that are part of the culture and how it's in the work that they're doing that is so detailed and so specific and so necessary. Just dig into your, just look into what you have in your own neighborhood, um, let alone go to the city and to the state. There's just art everywhere. And when you're walking down the street, when you see that painting, an artist did that. Or when you see that design of that building, an artist did that. Arts are everywhere. And so we want people to highlight it, to celebrate it, to support it, and to advocate for it. Michael Bobbitt, Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council. Thank you so much for joining me today. I wish you the best in your new role. And um, and hopefully this isn't the last time we talk. <laughs> we'll be back on it. Thank you so much, Tonya. We'll, I'll be back on any time you want me. Sure. You can learn more about the programs and communities that the Mass Cultural Council serves at massculturalcouncil.org. Remember, you can listen to this and past episodes of The Power Play wherever you subscribe to podcasts, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, and now Pandora Podcasts. Or you can watch us. Just simply go to YouTube and search the Hull Bay Productions media channel. And we air each and every Saturday at 5 p.m. on BroncoiRadio.com. So be sure to tune in to a new episode of The Power Play Show each Thursday at ThePowerPlayShow.com or wherever you subscribe to podcasts or watch us on our YouTube channel. Simply search the Hull Bay Productions media channel. And again, you can just visit our website at thepowerplayshow.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. Put on a mask, stay safe, and protect yourself and others. <laughs> <laughs>